I just want to walk through a few things that reflect um, a fair amount of thinking and work we've done around sports and military performance. Um, I want to welcome Randy Hill. He runs the ICT group. You've heard from so many of um, his, his faculty. Randy, just it's been so great working with you. Thanks for everything. Same and then, here. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Then your thoughts on, on the sports and military performance. And um, Steve Guerra has just donated an incredible amount of time. He's an expert. You know, he's, a, he's a Marine. And also uh, worked with a couple of NFL teams and is a well-known and, and very expert sports consultant. So your thinking and knowledge of both elite athletics and professional athletics and military has been amazing. A lot of the solutions that Randy's group has developed and we've talked about today with VR and, and, and AR and virtual humans, we also see great applicability to in, in sports performance and training. I just want to work through a, a little bit of the history of the Center for Body Computing and Elite Sports Performance and some of the things that we've tried to address. Often we'll have a solution, it's a sensor or it's, a, it's an app and it, or, or an athletic experience that could potentially be valuable and maybe a regulated company brings it to us, maybe a sensor company or it's a method of communication. And we always try to figure out who's the solution for. So even when we talk um, about patients or war fighters or, or players, um, it's always confusing. So if it's, if it's a war fighter or a military person, it's you know maybe the family and friends, if it's a solution for them, they just want their people to come back the way they, they were. If it's the actual war fighter or athlete, and these are the entities, the people that we usually try to design for, we try to make we try to stay aligned with our mission statement of providing the very best to the user. So we're trying to represent the interests of maybe the warfighter, and they, they obviously don't want to be injured. They want performance enhancement. Maybe they want career advancement. And then they're, the people they report to, you know, their interests are longevity of resources. They really need to, and same thing in elite athletics, identify people at risk or who aren't going to work out, both before they come into that assignment and during. And the same thing with athletics. Is this person in trouble? Is there going to be a problem? And then what's the, you know, what's the downstream problems with PTSD? Similarly, um, sometimes these solutions have multiple applicability, applicability to be valuable for very, a large number of constituencies. And that's important and promising because if we develop something that represents the inter interest of the player or the warfighter, maybe there's a business model or benefit. So for the fan, maybe it's really important to liberate a player's biometrics or G-forces. Uh, maybe that also helps the player in some way because they're going to not get injured or perform in a more uh, better or in a more um, intelligent way or train. Uh, maybe it's good for the team, obviously, because you can both appreciate and Paul, you've done a lot of this work, undervalued players, but also understand player value, improve your wins, and the league, you know, more revenue enhanced, uh, more wins, and et cetera. But the problem that we've run into, and it's a consistent problem, is that these interests are often not aligned at all in all of these organizations. So for the player or warfighter, you know, do they own the data? Is it theirs? Do they get to see it? Um, some people share, some don't. What are the union issues? Obviously, we don't want leagues are in our bedroom or et cetera, what, what endorsements, does, that's a good thing. Uh, how does it impact their own training staff, the team's training staff? Is it, is, they want an, anonymity, they want autonomy. Uh, for the team or the loved ones, it's a different set of interest and issues. Um, and for the leagues, um, and some of the say bosses, sometimes the interests are, are least aligned there when we think about the individual player because frankly, um, they're kind of expendable. Uh, Steve, you, you've talked a lot about about that, how many players in the NFL you say you know are actually not you know not expendable? What's your number? Oh, geez, um, probably ten percent. You know, everybody else is pretty fungible. I mean, you're looking at most teams that have anywhere between probably five to ten, you know, really like all-star players or not all-star but top-level players. Um, outside of that, teams there's a lot of churn, and the league's getting younger, especially in the, in the NFL. I mean, I've been watching games over the first, last couple of weeks, and I'm wondering why the quality of play is not very good compared to previous years. Um, and I think it's for two reasons. I think, one, players are younger. Um, and then, two, we've, you know, as a league, the NFL has abdicated 45 some odd training days. We used to start in the middle of March, in the beginning of March, and now we, we're, you know, we're beginning in the middle of April. So we're going from a March 1st start date to April 15th. So that's 45 days of rookies not being trained, veterans not being trained. So, so as we've kind of appreciated the, the problem set, we've, we're, in this current environment, we've come up with this idea that perhaps we can 
have a lot of discovery and represent the interests of the warfighter or the player best in the times when they're either not deployed or not in season. Um, I was, for the first five years working in the space, pretty delusional. I thought players would love this continuum of data between the team and the off season. They get load and they share it with everyone, and the opposite was true. They wanted to be, um, they wanted the autonomy of the off season. They wanted that shared with nobody. And they wanted to go to the places that they like and, and feel comfortable. And um, so it seemed like the off season was a good time and we could get our hands on the real estate then. It seemed like in between deployments or some military uh, uh, non-deployment uh, group of, of uh, soldiers that we could get our hands on and train and baseline. That w there would be no penalty for disclosure. Uh, so we could disclose the vulnerabilities and the information we collected directly to the warfighters, that they could maintain their autonomy, that this performance institute would be a safe zone where none of the data would ever get released uh, to anyone except for them. And we could completely baseline them, but do it serially. These players come back and people, uh, fighters come back to the same places in between things so we could get our hands on them and then give them this load over time, what team or where they were, where they were uh, uh, reporting to. And that potentially if we link these groups together, uh, they have a lot of commonality and we could really leverage all the tech that we have and um, start to make some real discovery, which I think you could argue has been lacking because of the fragmented way some of this tech and, and performance uh, uh, work has been done just because of the confines and the, and the demands of being in a professional team or being deployed. So the training approach that we've talked about is really integrating these groups in these training environments, uh, part of which would be at USC, partly would be in the places they train now. And the other concept, Randy, that, that you brought up around this I think is very interesting, um, and Steve as well, is we, the, in the military the need to train the trainer. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, that often, unlike a professional sports trainer, a lot of the people training these, these guys who are, you know, need to be capable on nuclear submarine for a long time and do critical tasks, maybe they're not getting the best training because they're 24 and uh, sure. no one trained them. Well, I think to me the thing that, the promise I see in this institute or this, this endeavor that we're, we're going to go out on here is that ability to scale that kind of professional, personalized type of training that... Uh, that sports gets now for, for their athletes and somehow trans, uh, translate that to a much larger force. And whether that's, we need to train the trainers and those are those sergeants that are down there with the soldiers. Uh, and also I think there's the potential for uh, all kinds of applications that can help the soldier begin to track their own performance and track how they're doing. I mean, I think there's uh, I like to experiment with a lot of the wearables, you know, for, for sports and that type of thing. And I'm never happy with what it tells me because it's, it, it just gives me a bunch of data and doesn't really give me the meaning. I think the idea I would like to see here is uh, we start to provide meaning, you know, uh, to, to the force. So. No, and I, I think post-deployment or, or after um, a season, you know, this question of what happened to me out there? Um, what happened to me this season? What happened to me on that deployment? Obviously, there, you've worked a lot in the cognitive space or PTSD, but no one's really collecting that now. What did that season do to me? And I've listened to a lot of players kind of speculate on it um, as, in terms of their contracts or, or anything, but I don't think there's a place that's actually kind of un -y, uh, that's giving them that data. Right. Well, that, that doesn't exist at all here in the U.S., right? There's no clearinghouse for expertise or knowledge period, inside a sport. We think that maybe it's the USOC, but the USOC is basically a fundraising arm for a bunch of NGBs. Um, they don't collect centralized information on sports performance and then distribute that. Um, and all the teams here in the US are paranoid about competitive advantage, so they exist in silos and they refuse to cooperate. It's unlike where you go to, like, you go to AFL, you go to Australia, and they share information much more freely. Um, you see entities in Europe like UK Sport and the English Institute of Sport in Australia, the Australian Institute of Sport, where this knowledge is actually housed. There is no entity here in the United States that is a clearinghouse for best practices in sport period, whether that's on the performance side or commercial side, to be perfectly honest. And how about the, just the strength of the idea of taking uh, soldiers and pairing them with lead athletes and trying to create a common culture. I mean, there are, there are a lot that each group can, can offer each other, I think. There are some areas where some are more disciplined and less, and there, seem, there could be some value sharing there that could be pretty powerful, I think. I, I mean, I think without a doubt. Um, so my background <clears throat> lends itself directly to that. Um, so I did not play college football 
at all. You know, I played in high school, went to college, drank a lot, um, and then ended up graduating finally, served in the Marine Corps. Um, and then when I got hired to be the money ball guy for the San Diego Chargers, uh, my very first day they fired Marty Schottenheimer and then they brought Norv Turner in and I ended up Four years later, I was the assistant tight ends coach. And then a year after that, I was the assistant quarterbacks coach. So how does a guy who's never played college ball actually become a football coach in the NFL? Honestly, it was because I was in the Marine Corps. Because that gave me the credibility that I actually understood what a football player was going through on a day-to-day -day basis. And there's an amount of respect that's translated between those two domains. And then here at the end of the day, too, one of the things I learned from my time in the NFL is that a 21-year-old Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps is essentially the same exact human being as a 21-year-old rookie in the NFL. The difference is, is one has a lot of money, the other one has a lot of ingenuity and creativity at his disposal. So they can both get into a tremendous amount of trouble, all right? Um, so that's one thing. But then the second thing is, is that we're also asking both of those populations to do something that is fundamentally in, in non -human act, an inhuman act to a certain degree, right? So an NFL player, we're asking him to run at high rates of speed into another football player. And in the Marine Corps, we're teaching them how to kill another human being. So that elicits a whole other set of dynamics that you have to take into account when you're training and working with this, both of these populations. But because of that, they are completely similar. Being a quarterback's coach in the NFL was just like being a platoon commander in the Marine Corps. Um, I think that the idea that, it, and I hate to, you know, I don't want to be overly poetic about this, but they're also both kind of tragic figures because when they're done, they're a little bit discarded. Mm -hmm. And uh, some may have more money than others or not, but uh, how do, you know, do you think we can discover a little more about how to make them more resilient when they come off of that? Yeah, I, you know, actually, uh, I'm not, speaking for the Army, but I know they're doing studies right now to look at soldiers more holistically. And I mean, for instance, there was a, you can see there's a picture, it was out maybe 10 years ago of a soldier who'd just been dropped into Iraq and he had this load on him that was about probably 120 pounds. And I think that even when they've discarded some of their backpacks, but they're just in their, their battle gear, they're still way, they still are carrying 60 pounds or more because it, it's the body armor, the, the water, the ammunition, everything that they need. And I think 30% of the injuries in the evacs from the recent wars have been due to musculoskeletal injuries and an early onset of arthritis because of all of the weight that they're carrying. Uh, yeah, so I think there's a lot we can learn and we can do, you know, just to be able to see that this is happening and maybe prepare people. I've even heard stories about how people got injured lifting weights to try to prepare themselves for carrying the, you know, the loads. So I, I, I think you know, in a performance domain, there's a lot we could collect, there's a lot we could do uh, that, would, that would help prevent the injuries and, and understand them. I think the thing that I'd be interested in people's comments are about is we're, we think we can find the professional athletes easy enough because of this. We're trying to identify and understand what the best group of soldiers is to put into a program like this, if it's a special operations person versus, um, say, a recon unit. And we're exploring these, these different um, groups to see how we can best partner and meet their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, interested in any thoughts from our heavily loaded athletic military table over here? Um, do you think, um, James, you're, can we have a mic back here? Um, do, would, a, would, a, uh, would a Philadelphia Eagle, uh, how would they feel about, about when they go to their regular off-season place, getting quantified a little bit and baselined? And that, you'd never know about it. How would your org feel? How do you think the players would feel? And then partnered in, a, in that training environment with a military personnel. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's a hard question. I mean, I think there's some things to do with the off-season. Uh, the players believe that's their, kind of their time off. Um, but it's funny just mentioning about the, the strength training and, and getting injured. I think a lot of it comes down to periodization, you know. So for, you know, we're starting later in April. They have time off in summer and then they're coming into a really hard regime of training camp. Really, the, the best thing to do is actually train during the summer, build up into training camp um, and that's how you minimise injuries that way instead. Um, and so I think there's definitely carryover from a military standpoint too, is how, how are these guys getting periodised with their training at the same time and, and, and what's, the, what's the baseline uh, needed for them to carry 
a bunch of gear and, and you know 120 pounds in their back or whatever the requirements are and then how do we how do we reach that need at the same time so i think it's definitely carry over and and same with the respect thing like there's definitely respect for for all, all men and women who are, have served in the military as well especially nfl community and i think you see that acro across the board um having having exposure to both whether it be marine corps or seal teams or whatever it is there's, there's definitely a commonality between the two especially from a just a, a toughness, grittiness, get through mental barrier, that, that standpoint as well, it, it definitely crosses over. And does it threaten you at all? Like sometimes doctors are really threatened when we talk about their patients having all this information about themselves and being diagnosed by the time they land at your door and uh, do not, doctors like to control things. Does it bother you that we'd be sending a player to you who'd be pretty savvy as to his load, vulnerabilities, lactate level at a certain, run in a certain route? Or is that something you'd welcome? No, I mean, from a sports science standpoint, that, that gets me excited. It's like, it's, <laughs> this guy knows where he's at and what he, what he needs to do. He knows how to squat. He knows how to run. He knows what his requirements are. All right, so now we can have a conversation, a really like, deep and meaningful conversation about how do we get this guy better and perform at his ab absolute peak. And, and I think the key really is sustaining that peak for as long as possible. It's one thing to hit optimal time and optimal uh, training, but if you can sustain that for as long as you can and increase the his livelihood from two and a half years on average to eight to 10, I mean, that, that, that's awesome. Paul, do you think, do you think there, um, you've been kicking around the NBA and NFL and Euro European sports, do you think there's a need for an independent UN like this to get their hands on these guys for some amount of time to try to do some of this other than organized sports or military? Do you think this is a niche that we can have some discovery in? It would be very helpful for everyone, obviously, because we want to be able to get that data for a long period of time. That's the problem with a lot of the athletes that we have now. They might not be with a team. They might be with James only for a year or maybe even two. So he's barely getting a baseline on them before they're off to somebody else. And like you had mentioned, they're not sharing it. They're not going to, that data doesn't go with them. Uh, it, some of the internal GPS data and, and uh, loads that they're checking. So some way to be able to look at that data, collect it, and then help the youth later on, how do we develop programs to, to build them? Um, so, but learn from the data beforehand. And uh, yeah, so some type of a UN would be interesting, but then again, who controls it? What, what do, how are you trying to use the data? That's probably the, the sticking piece for, to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we'd ever sell the data. That's something companies don't tell you up front, right? They say, no, we're never gonna sell it, but oh, now we're gonna sell it. Um, we could be bound by that with our with our structure and our governance, right? Like the UN, that this would never be sold, right? And that would be given to the player and you know in the store. And never hacked. Exactly. That's that's the <laughs> problem because we were actually just talking about that now because the data that I collect in the NBA, the performance data that I collect in the NBA, can only be sold back to the NBA teams. So mm. what I'd use, the media never sees. Uh, uh, some real basic stuff we might give them, but um, there are a couple teams that are afraid that uh, that's going to get hacked and somebody's going to get a hold of this data. So yeah, it is, it's definitely a concern. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to change the models with the way that data is even managed, period, across the globe in any industry, but certainly with inside of sport, right? Is that yeah, I think you're going to see a pullback where people don't necessarily want to have these huge databases because they don't want a Yahoo to happen to them. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I think that that's where like having a really good clearinghouse, a consortium of people um, who are, you know, uniquely positioned, I think, to to manage that process more than anything else. Now, storing the data, that's an entirely different conversation, I think, because at the end of the day, you know, it really is the player's data. Um, I mean, I think Evan in the last panel talked about it, you know, control. Right, control of your own destiny, your own development as an athlete is really, really important to them. Um, and I think for a lot of soldiers, it's the same exact way. Um, and I think providing, it, it, I, I don't think anyone necessarily has a solution right now, but we we can use sport as a living laboratory to figure that out. And I think that can then be extrapolated out into other industries. I think that's great. And you know, part of this is we really want to expose these guys, uh, men and women, early and earlier to advances in orthopedic surgery or injections or things. And when we start to see this damage and load, you know, we can also intervene because we've got the pipeline through the standard, you know, medical system potentially earlier and hopefully, you know, not have them get to the place where a lot of them ultimately get to, which is, you know, you can't believe they're able to walk on the golf course if they're not lucky to, to walk or sit on an, they can't sit on an airplane or, you know, it's kind of amazing what they can't do, mm -hmm. uh, as you said. Let's thank 
this group of presenters. Thank you.